I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, D.C. neighbor sues over secondhand marijuana smoke. More political maneuvering from the Mikulski announcement. If Hillary tanks, will O'Malley have a chance? Stay tuned. Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by education activist Cynthia Rubenstein, former chairman of the Montgomery County Republican Central Committee, Mark Unkefer, attorney and former Republican candidate for county executive, Jim Shalek, and Democrat political strategist, Susan Heltimus. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. Last week, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser allowed legislation to go into effect that decriminalized the possession of small amounts of marijuana, which D.C. voters overwhelmingly approved by referendum. As with the legislation in, of marijuana in Washington State and Colorado, the public and law enforcement are watching the impact that's going to have on the public in general. This week, we learned one unintended consequence when Brendan and Nessa Coppinger sued their next-door neighbor, Edwin Gray, over infiltration of secondhand smoke, including marijuana smoke, into their home. The Coppingers alleged negligence, nuisance, and trespassing. Additionally, they're seeking $500,000 in damages, but more importantly, they're seeking a ban on the smoking of any substance in Mr. Gray's home. Jim, what makes this story more surreal is that D.C. Superior Court Judge Rona Lee Beck enjoined Gray from even smoking in his own house. What do you make of this? Well, Casey, first the damages seem a little excessive, a half a million dollars, but from a legal theory, even if you're in your own home or on your own property, if what you do affects the neighbors, you can be guilty of a public nuisance. For example, if you don't mow your lawn for six months, you can be charged and sued for having a public nuisance. If you smoke pot in your house and the smoke goes into your neighbor's home, even though you did it in your house, you're affecting the public. So he's got to keep his smoke and his grass cut <laughs> to stay out of court. So, so are you advocating the smoking of marijuana in, in someone's house? Well, it's legal in D.C. You can smoke pot in your own house, I believe, in D.C. Mm -hmm. But if the smoke gets out of your house, then you're affecting others, and that's the problem here. Okay, Susan, Mr. Gray has been living in his home since 1964. Shouldn't he be allowed to smoke a little weed in his own house if he wants to? Well, Casey, in setting up this story, you neglected a couple of important issues. The, the people who did the suing have a toddler and the wife is pregnant. And there's a problem with the chimney in his house and there are problems in the basement between the two houses. And down, at times, the basement is filled with smoke. Part of the settlement was is that both of them were going to have their house inspected and he also was supposed to fix his house. Now, I find this ironic coming up now because someone I know is moving from a condo complex in this county and wants to get out because the smoke is coming through and he has a problem with breathing issues and he has to move so it's a bigger issue than what we probably think so but I mean I can't imagine that that a person has to go through all kind of efforts to keep smoke inside his own but they, why they, don't why don't the people uh, winterize or, or well he has well, to because why, his, do, his why doesn't chimney, the coppingers do it well because it's his problem if I, if my neighbors had a problem why should Mark, I have to th fix this their is making wealth? the case for marijuana edibles I think yeah, so there you go <laughs> well you the, mow your grass and you make so, brownies so, yeah. the, the, the primary smoke issue is the tobacco issue the marijuana smoke is a secondary issue, and it's, it's scientifically proven that secondhand smoke is, is toxic and dangerous mm -hmm. for children oh and adults. Um, and if his th house this is this in this repair, issue would this go is, this away if Mr. Gray that, that would fill have. the cracks 
in his house and look, fix look, the this, chimney. This just is about intolerance of, of allowing other people to live their own lives without without having you impose it's your, a health your, issue. Oh, come it's on. But the editor issue. said there was smoke issue. in their basement because of the cracks in look, his wall. Look, this is the broader picture issue is having having other people tell you how you can live your life. No, if there you can do anything you want in your house unless it's damaging. For instance, Susan? my neighbors had a leak on their side of the house. It caused Susan. damage in my house. They had to fix it, not me. All right, Susan, you have a last word on that? Uh. And we're going to go on because this is a more fun topic. <laughs> The announcement by four-term Democratic Senator Barbara Mikulski that she would not seek a fifth term in office has set off a mad scramble in both political parties for possible replacements. Locally, Congressman Chris Van Hollen was the first to announce, and he would soon join by fellow Representative Donna Edwards and possibly John Delaney. Other Democrats who have been mentioned are Baltimore Mayor Stephanie Rollins-Blake, Baltimore Congressman John Sarbanes, and Dutch Ruppersberger. On the Republican side, Congressman Andy Harris and former Anne Arundel County Executive Laura Newman have been mentioned, as well as the possibility that former Gov Maryland Governor Bob Ehrlich might run. Mark, how do you view the contenders well, so far? the names, it's sort of like the Donald Trump season, where everybody feels compelled to get their name in, and some of those names will wither away. I heard, Jim, are you, are you thinking about running for the Senate? I decline. Okay, well that I was the, the shortest, that's the shortest Senate campaign that we've had so far. No, I, I think when we get down to it, uh, the probability is that Andy Harris won't run for the Senate. I think he's probably going to stay in his uh, House seat. Someone like Laura Newman really has nothing to lose. Is it an attractive candidate and may well run? Cynthia, uh, in addition to the ones we've talked about, there's a possibility that former Montgomery County Delegate Heather Mazier has also been rumored as a possible candidate. Is she going to put her hat in the ring? Um, she's deliberating right now. She was on Kojo Namdi on Friday afternoon and was mulling it over on air with Kojo and um, Tom Sherwood. You know, things in her favor. Number one, she does have uh, statewide name recognition from her race as governor. She has deep um, grassroots support across the state of Maryland. There's already a draft Heather movement on social media. Um, but she's sitting back. She's not going to rush into it. Um, you know, it's, it's a heavy burden to consider jumping back into a political race. Well, uh, Susan, I want to I go to you because I think, I think what's, what's shaping up uh, as a fascinating race is the fact that you have Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and Baltimore politicians all going to be vying for this Senate seat. And it's going to set up a, a real demonstration of where the political power lies. Well, um, today um, I was at the County Public Safety Awards luncheon, and the word there was, and you didn't mention this, uh, that Elijah Cummings is probably going to enter the race. Now that's good for Chris thus far because the Baltimore and Prince George's, both African American candidates, the, the thing, the issue with Heather's race is that there is not public funding and she has a hard time raising money. So it is, it, at this point, you know, Chris seemed in high spirits today. Senator Mikulski was there you're, and you're, spoke. you're not answering the question though about the, about the, the power. Where is the power going to be in this election? Um, it's going to be uh, split, uh, but I think that a, Montgomery County has the most votes. And what you didn't comprehend was that if Cummings and Excuse Edwards me. are both in, the black vote is going to be torn. And I think a lot of whites from across the state, and Chris Van Hollen now represents more than Montgomery County, I think he will be in good shape. Okay. I, I've got an yeah. interesting prediction, Casey. You know, in a, in a crowded primary, you could win with maybe 20% of the vote. I predict there's going to be either a media person or a business executive that nobody's heard of yet to come in with their own $10 million check and possibly steal this election. All these local pals, are, they, they're going to invite some outsider with a big bankroll to be surprised. And that right. big bankroll is John Delaney, who, after getting less than 50% of the vote in the last election, has nothing to lose but to spend his money running for the Senate. I don't think he's ready to give up his seat because he is one of the names that is seriously being mentioned for governor next time. And I somehow think that John Delaney would rather be Governor Delaney than Senator Delaney. He is a business person, and I think being governor would be far more appealing 
to him than being a son. Casey, the, these races will thin out, though. People are now just putting their names out. But when they realize they got to raise $10, 20000000 million, that list is going to be very short because well, nobody's going to get up a safe, a safe congressional seat and if they can't raise well, $10, well, 20000000 million. I think it's going to be interesting. All of these candidates are going to be doing polling. And um, as, as we hear about polling in dribs and drabs, the picture is going to become much clearer as to w how this can shake out statewide and, and, and for each of these supposed in. candidates. Van Hollen and Edwards well, are I, in. Well, I think, I think obviously on the Democratic side, because of the strength of the, of the candidates, there's going to be a lot more focus and attention on those. And I think it's going to come down to, to you're going to, you're going to see, as Jim has suggested, there will be some falling out, but there's going to be a Baltimore candidate. There's going to be a Prince George's candidate, and there'll be a Montgomery and candidate. And you didn't mention it, Kendall Early. Her name is out there too, as somebody well, who well, might run. Well, isn't that special? It is special. Uh, <laughs> a woman on the since, Republican since side. Since every Laura bad Newman. decision that Bob Bob Ehrlich made while in office was attributed to Kendall, isn't that great that she's going to think think about running? Well, she. When we come back from this short break, more political musical chairs, and is Martin O'Malley a viable candidate for president? Stay tuned. Can you call this? A And welcome back. With so many elected members of Congress having either announced or considering running for the U.S. Senate, those who have been waiting patiently in the wings for their opportunity to run are emerging as well. In the 4th District congressional seat being vacated by Donna Edwards, that has already drawn announcements from two very high-profile politicians, former Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown and former Prince George's County uh, Attorney, State's Attorney Glenn Ivey who have both announced. In the 8th Congres Congressional District, there's been much more speculation who might run, but only so far has Delegate Kumar Barvey officially announced. Susan, let's focus on Van Hollen's seat. Who else is thinking of running? Oh my God, the list is growing. First of all, Arianna Kelly is, is supposedly going to announce. Jamie Raskin was going to defer to Rich Madalino. Um, Senator Raskin's from the 20th, Madalino's in the 18th. Madalino said no, so it's just a matter of time when Jamie Raskin is going to enter in. Um, Hans Reamer is supposedly thinking about it, and the story that I've heard is that Hans, if Hans Reamer announces he's going to be asked to leave the county council because um, you can't do both. Um, Valerie Irvin's name has been um, uh, also thrown out there, and there are those who are saying, well, she quit a school board seat, she quit the county council, um, people probably weren't going to give her a chance. And then I have my list here. Oh, and the biggest one of all, perhaps, is Kathleen Matthews. Used to be at Channel 7. She is a vice president at Marriott in term, uh, for media. She is the wife of MSNBC, um, Chris Matthews. And she is like one of the few high profile Democrats at Marriott. And so because of that, she could bring in a lot of money. And um, so I think she's going to be in that race, too, from what I'm hearing. Well, that's, a, that's an exhaustive list, Cynthia. Not quite exhaustive. Oh, my oh, goodness. No. <laughs> oh, and there's That list is longer. Guess what? There's more. Guess what? There's more. <laughs> I, I, I was on all the blogs today. Um, others talking about it. Anasol Gutierrez, Jeff Waldstriker, um, Roger Mano, Bill Frick, Nancy Florine, Nancy Navarro, um, Will Jawando, and those, and so it's, it's a total of 14 or 15 people who are mulling over District 8. See, they don't have to give up their seats. No, Delegates and council people don't have to give up their seat like Congress for the Senate. Yeah. So you're going to have a ton of people because they can keep their job and still run. Well, but Mark, let, let's, let's, let's uh, strain the, the wheat from the chaff here because those who don't have any money or any ability to raise the money are going to have a hard time. Who are the real pretenders and contenders for the... For well, I think, I mean, we talked about Kathleen Matthews as a, a sort of a figure with her husband, uh, certainly could have come in very strongly. Uh, I, and she can raise money. And she can raise money, but is she yes. Gonna get a, is she going to get the Democratic loyalists to, to vote for her? She'd have to make a convincing argument because... Um, I mean, you got you to toil in the vineyards With a certain a Democratic bit, right? base in, in, in this area, someone who comes in from 
quote unquote business is going to have to make a very convincing argument that they are not from the dark side. But she is she is media <laughs> Sorry. serious. But she is media savvy and she, she is, is articulate savvy. and people will recognize the name and the face. It's all but about the money. But but the, but, the, but the question is in a in a primary election is that going to is that going to matter well, or, or, or are they going to reward the people who have been working for them? As, as the activists coming out and rewarding the people. Well, who, but it goes beyond Montgomery County. You know, there could be people in other county, and she might fare very well in Frederick County. You know, in those other places that the eighth goes into. Casey, it's all about the money. If she has five million dollars, she wins. If you have seven people running and you've got millions of dollars, yeah. the money's going to win a crowded primary. Right. So, as we, before we wrap it up, what about Republicans? We, 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 Thank you, Susan. That was, you just Who's took the, the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> Mark, what about Republicans? Well, one of the names we've heard is Frank Howard, who uh, ran in, uh, for the state Senate in District 14, is thinking about uh, running in that seat. Uh, and I also, I mean, this, this seat, the Republican votes aren't as much in Montgomery County as they are up in Carroll County, which is a very conservative area. Uh, and so there are more folks up there who might want to take a look at it well, as well. Dave Wallace, who didn't have that much money, he got about 40% of the vote. Who's Dave Howard. Wallace? Exactly, and he got 40% exactly. of the vote. Who is he? He ran for Congress last time against Van Hollen as a Republican, had no money, and got 40% of the vote. Well, we're going to have to cut it off there because we're going to go on to our last topic, but it's pretty interesting that uh, the, the number of Republicans even in consideration are down to two. <laughs> All right, so when, we come, when uh, former Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley first expressed his 2016 presidential ambitions, to many he seemed he was running as an alternative to the presumptive front-runner Secretary Hillary Clinton. Now with revelations over Mrs. Clinton's questionable use of private emails when she was Secretary of State, the inev inevitability of her nomination now seems in question. Mark. Has O'Malley been able to position himself as the alternative? Well, I don't think he's done much, but uh, the circumstances with Hillary Clinton has certainly uh, dinged her uh, the sense of inevitability. I think people are remembering the, the downside of the Clinton years, which was the, the scandals and the obfuscations, and um, it's something that is bringing her approval ratings back down to earth. Now, Martin O'Malley may not have done much, but he may be inheriting a bit of a a boomlet because of that. Cynthia, with the troubles facing Mrs. Clinton, as we've just talked about, are there other Democrats likely to run? I think this, the email gate is going to be a temporary ding for Hillary Clinton. She'll, this is, this is going to pass. Um, I'm sure the Elizabeth Warren supporters are fervently hoping that maybe there's an in for her, but I, I really, I, no. Do you really, do you, wait a minute, do you really think that if the emails uh, are shown to be a violation of federal law that it's going to be a tempest in a teapot? It was not, I think it was not a violation of federal law. When she was wait, secretary how can, of state. How can you categorically say well, that, wait a minute. Susan? There was, Nobody knows. No, there was, it was not against the law. It was written. And your beloved Senator Colin, Secretary Colin Powell did the same thing. He's admitted it. When he was there, wait he minute, did Susan, the same thing. Don't obfuscate by, by bringing up Secretary Powell. Let's stick to the facts. The rule, the rule of law may have been different when Powell was Secretary and of State. And it has changed since Secretary Clinton was there, but when she was there, it was acceptable. And I'm sorry, Republicans, you fret all you want. She did nothing wrong. And I'm, I'm glad that you've got your investigation completed Ugh. and that and that you've determined factually and legally that there has been nothing Casey, wrong. Jim. Casey, don't sell O'Malley short. Good looking, articulate, and in a Democratic primary controlled by liberals, in Maryland, he gave us same-sex marriage, uh, eliminate the death penalty, uh, gambling. So he's promoted issues that in a Democratic primary are very popular. Don't sell him short. And he's an Irish rock star. Mark, don't, don't sell him short. <laughs> I know. I was going to say, he was an Irish rock star. No, sorry. I, go and ahead. He looks good in a muscle shirt. Well, oh, the, does the, he the, ever. The, the real question is. In a primary, he's, he could be tough. The I real question is, will no. Democrats, despite Susan's protestations start looking for an alternative candidate. Oh, I think they already have. Historically, Republicans go with the front runner and Democrats, it can be kind of a free for all. We'll see if the the, the phenomena reverses itself and, and Clinton has the advantage of being the front runner. 
Uh, but remember what happened with Bill Clinton many years ago. He came out of effectively nowhere because nobody else was interested in running. The same thing could happen in 2016. I, 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 I've said this before. When I was in Minnesota last October, I heard Governor O'Malley speak to the Minnesota Democratic Party. He was very eloquent. He was very articulate. He had a commanding message, and the message was received, and they liked the messenger. People said very nice things, and, you know, he is. He is very but photogenic, and, um, and, and now what came out this last week in the newspapers was this stat. He had city stat, then he had state stat. And people are looking at that say, hey. I thought you were going to bring up the statistic that he was on Morning Joe this, this week and Hillary Clinton was at 86 points and he was 11. He says, oh my God, I'm doing that well. Did my <laughs> Did mother do the polling? But yes. Susan, because he had broken into the double digits. Yeah. But how's so. he going to raise $100 million? That's the key, minimum. That they, is the you problem. Know, the, this race, they say, is going to cost a billion dollars total. He needs $100 million. Yeah, That's the key. Well, and it's in any race, just like these States, it's, U.S. Senate rates, and the congressional races, there are a lot of people who would like it, but they can't compete with the big guys in terms of raising money. And, and Hillary can raise big money. She yes. can raise big money. But if and, Hillary and you is can't, not you, in the race, and there's a possibility. She, she's going to stay in the race. Casey, well, you, you are keep such, on such dreaming, true, Casey. Keep on dreaming. Well, thank, thank you. I, I will. When, when I wake up from this uh, brief uh, break, we'll come back for parting shots. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Uh, now with parting shots, uh, Susan Heltmas. <laughs> um, I, I was pleased this last week that two things are occurring in Annapolis. First, um, Governor Hogan is actually s said that he is actually thinking about the death with dignity uh, legislation, and that you know once he said there was no way that he was going to uh, support assisted suicide, but he is thinking about it. The other thing is, is um, legislation marches on with giving um, felons when they become come out of jail the right to vote, and that is looking better. And I just want to say goodbye to my friend Art Wallenstein, the director of the Cor Correction Facility. Today was his last day, and I went to a party for him and he is one of the most loved people in Montgomery County. He is respected, he is liked, and he is going to be sorely missed. Good luck, Art. Thank you, Susan. Jim Shalek, your parting shot. Well, Casey, you know, we all yearn and hope that when we elect people or they get appointed, that they're leaders. The example of leadership this week was, to me, fantastic. The president of the University of Oklahoma, former Senator David Boren, mm -hmm. talk about leadership. I wish he was the superintendent of schools here. When these punks, did what they did, mm -hmm. these thugs, and what they said. N not only did he throw them off campus, he threw the fraternity off campus, they took the, the initials off the building, and they had to be out by midnight. That's leadership, and that's what people yearn for. I wish we had it in this county in our school superintendent. Thank you, Jim. Mark Conkerford, your parting shot. Well, I'd like to comment on the, uh, the legislature, which has not been responsive to the Maryland voters in failing to act on the uh, proposal to get rid of the rain tax. Uh, they may have uh, dodged the bullet, so to speak, this year, but I noticed that in the Senate there was more of uh, more traction, not so much uh, in the House. Uh, it'll be back again, and I predict that before those four years are out, uh, Larry Hogan will get that rain tax cut. Thank you, Mark. Mm. Cynthia Rubenstein, your party shot. Well, I want to echo um, Susan's sentiments about, about Art Wallenstein, who is one of the most humane and wise people on the face of the earth. Um, so uh, well-deserved retirement for Art, but we are really going to miss him. Um, I, my parting shot, I like to read this little article in the post that appears sometimes called Speaking of Science. Um, I want urge you to seek it out. Um, a new study suggests that liberals may be a happier bunch compared to conservatives. <laughs> Researchers believe that conservatives could have a reputation for being happy because it's in their nature to talk themselves up. Researchers found more genuine smiles and more positive language in the web trail of liberals. The reason, researchers say, is that political conservatives have a tendency to self-aggrandize 
and liberals are being more honest. Well, uh, Cynthia, th thank you, we're thank so you. happy. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you, Cynthia, for patting yourself and Susan on the back. Uh, <laughs> thank you, panel, for being here this evening, and thank you, audience, uh, for viewing and tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest-hitting political talk show. For 21 This Week, I'm Casey Aiken.